Langdon, Langdon was the first book review for today's innovator, so I greatly appreciate, appreciate that um, and started the ball rolling, so I saw another one out there recently. Um, like you said, I'm going to talk about how do you mobilize an organization for disruption, and one of my core theses is that innovation is best when it's treated not as an outcome, but rather as a competency that an organization builds and nurtures uh, over time. So in order to mobilize any organization, whether that's academia or government or a, a business, uh, you have to have an understanding of what types of things are, are potentially going to be disrupting you. And then you have to have a plan for readying your organization for that disruption. And then ultimately, you need to set a, a responsive strategy for how do you make decisions rapidly around all of the threats of disruptions that are presenting themselves for your company so, or, or organization. So that's everything that we'll talk about here. That is a bit of a challenge in uh, 25 minutes, but we'll get right into it. Um, so the first most important thing is to recognize what I call patterns of disruptions. And perhaps one of the most famous is the, the S-curve of business models or technology, uh, which describes a, a fairly typical path of any business model or technology. It starts out in a stage of infancy. It goes through a period of rapid or prolonged expansion, uh, and then ultimately matures off uh, and, and uh, companies then start to struggle at the top of that curve, or organizations begin to struggle at the top of that curve as they compete for whatever market share or, or whatever returns are left uh, as that business model ages. Um, the market leaders for any business model or technology tend to spend a lot of their energy in this expansion stage. They try to deal with the growing pains of how do you scale up a technology which is booming. Uh, often they're fat and happy, and they're, you know, they're organizations that can make investments in people, they can make investments in systems, and that is where their blinders are set, is how do I continue to grow the heck out of this business model or technology, which is in the, in the, the, the expansion stage of this S-curve. What they're missing is, uh, this disruptions, or the, the, the uh, diminishing returns that happen at the maturity stage. And so a lot of the, the organizations that are fat and happy during the expansion stage have not paid attention to the disruptors that are inevitably coming and will often make a declaration of, in, of innovation way too late, you know, at the point in time that they begin to experience the diminishing re returns, which is very different than growing pains. Uh, this is a time where they're starting to make layoffs, they're starting to see their leadership boards turn over. Whatever that looks like, uh, it becomes very painful. So I kind of implied that there's a, a pattern of a second S-curve which starts to appear over time. So when you are in a period of expansion for a business model or technology, you know, the market leaders can rest and they can, they can be part of that and, and really enjoy it. But on another hill somewhere, somewhere far away, there's a whole team of startups or uh, other organizations that are trying to disrupt whatever business model or technology is, is currently uh, going through this, this great expansion phase. And that is the second S-curve that you see on the right here. Um, and as we talked about, uh, or as Langdon mentioned, these are the companies like your Blockbuster or uh, Kodak who are, are going through the expansion phase, fighting the film wars, right, going against Fuji head to head, they even invented digital photography, but still missed the second S-curve of, of digital photography coming uh, that blindsided Kodak and, and wiped them out. So that's one pattern of disruption that you want to look for. Another important pattern of disruption, and, and uh, this was alluded to this morning uh, by Tom, I believe, but it's this idea of exponential growth. So as humans, we love linear growth, which is that blue line at the bottom. We love to put something into a box and see something come out on the other side. Right? We make an investment and get a return. That's linear. It's very easy to get our heads around that. Um, since the industrial age, we have begun to become more comfortable with what's called accelerated growth, which is that second line, which I think is purple. Um, so accelerating growth, we, we can now get our heads around it. Right? There's many people putting stuff into the function, and there's much more stuff coming out on the other side. And we've gotten used to that as well. You know, we, that's still a little bit more comfortable than the alternative, which is exponential growth. Uh, and as Tom's displayed or, or alluded to with the, the stacking of papers, it gets out of hand very quickly when something is growing at an exponential rate. Exponential growth of anything changes the rules of the game. 
So when you see a disruptor that is experiencing exponential growth, you can expect that some rules of the game are going to change, and we'll get into some examples shortly. Uh, the third pattern I wanted to talk about, particularly because we just wrapped up a uh, blockchain segment, is something that's called the hype cycle. Now, the hype cycle, uh, for those of you who have invested in any cryptocurrencies, you'll probably recognize this graph. A hype cycle is when the hype exceeds the value of whatever it is, whatever business model or technology, and some measure really you know, gets out of control, and then everyone realizes, wait a second, there is no value to that, and the attention goes away or the value drops out. But in the meantime, while that hype is occurring, the underlying technology continues to experience growth. So during the hype cycle, while there is this crash, like the Bitcoin crash of, when was that, early? 2018, um, when there is that crash, blockchain still continu continues to plot along, it continues to make progress, and maybe even exponential growth. So what you want to do when you recognize these patterns of disruption is take an attempt to demystify for yourself and for your organizations what's actually going on here. So I'll take you su through some examples. With respect to blockchain, I just, uh, I just talked about how uh, Cryptocurrencies have followed the hype cycle, but the underlying technology and perhaps the smart contract uh, technology is probably on something of an S-curve uh, pattern, where it's in its infancy right now. It's going to go through a period of rapid expansion, but at, at some point in the future, even that smart, smart contract blockchain technology will be disrupted by something that we don't know quite what it is yet. Another example, artificial intelligence, um, because it is uh, related intimately to computer processing power, the growth of artificial intelligence is much more likely not to be on an S-curve, but to be an exponential growth pattern, uh, which we as, as consumers, as humans, will struggle to understand exactly what's going on in this domain. Um, the exponential growth coincides with Moore's Law, which as an aside for, for those of you who, who don't know, uh, was a, a term coined by Gordon Moore, who was an Intel executive in the 1960s, who said that the, I believe it was the number of transistors in an integrated circuit is doubling every 18 months and the cost is coming down by half. Uh, that pattern continued well, well, well into the future and it has continued even to today, while the Moore's Law has been declared dead several times. It has been uh, resuscitated by new technologies and new S-curves which, which have entered in and continued the fuel. While there is a physical limit on the number of transistors that can exist in an integrated circuit, the spirit of Moore's Law, which is the, the price performance doubling over a period of time, should continue to live on for much, much longer than we reach that physical limitation because of new technologies. Autonomous vehicles, um, we're seeing driverless tech, um, like the telecom industry, will probably see a series of S-curves, which are generations of technology, or generations of disruption, which kind of sequence along. So you have your telecom, first 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, et cetera, and now into 5G. Um, but the underlying sensors and the underlying processors that are going to fuel your autonomous cars are probably on an exponential growth curve. Um, it won't be long before you simply take your phone into your autonomous vehicle, plug your phone in, and that's going to navigate you to wherever it is you, you need to go, uh, because there's all this processing power now on your phone, and that's doubling every 18 months, and that's a great source, so you don't have to build it into the car. Um, and the last, the last industry I'll talk about is renewables. And this one's an interesting one, not because of exponential growth, but actually exponential decline or decay the marginal cost of renew renewable energy is now following an exponential curve. It is, its price performance is improving, I believe, by 24% in a per every period of 12 months. Essentially what that means is that the marginal cost of renew renewable energy will converge to zero well within our lifetimes, probably within the next 10 to 12 years. Uh, so pretty exciting that renewable energy is going to follow that path. But if you are in the oil industry, uh, it's a little bit daunting, and that's going to be your disruptor. So once you understand these patterns of disruption, what you want to consider is what kind of stages is this disruption going to move through? And we've heard examples of all of these stages today. So I loved kind of sitting through everyone's talks and hearing about what stages these things are in. Um, the proof of concept stage, this is your, this is your Bitcoin uh, for blockchain, right? The Bitcoin was a single use case 
which was very useful because it established a proof of concept for an underlying technology called blockchain. Um, but Bitcoin itself and, and blockchain itself are, are really you know, limited until we start to develop some standards of how you actually deal with this underlying technology. So eventually something will move into an emergent stage, which is a lot of what we've heard about in the last three or four talks, and, and certainly uh, what IBM is doing is, is creating isolated, contained networks and applying something like blockchain technology in an isolated contained network. Now it's in an absence of standards. There's a wild, wild west here, right? IBM's creating their own standards. There's other standards being created underground by, you know, by uh, secretive people who are, who are trying to disrupt governments. And, and who knows which one is it's gonna come out on top. What we will see very shortly, and we're starting to see already, is blockchain enters into the substitutive stage where technology, the technology begins to substitute itself for things that we take for granted today. A great example here is with TCP IP technology, which fueled the World Wide Web, you saw Amazon as an early substitutive uh, entrant for selling books. And it was before the, the web was truly transformational, but it was a great kind of study in, okay, the business models are changing, there is a disruption actually happening here. And we're gonna start to see some of those things with blockchain very soon if we're not seeing them already. But ultimately, these disruptors end up in a transformative stage where the standards and platforms become established and new business models begin to emerge. These are business models we can't even dream of today. So what do you do when you recognize all of these patterns? Well, naturally, if you're in an organization, you, you need to try to forecast, you know, where is this going? It's easy to see where it's been, so you can, you can track trends backwards and then project them forward. And in fact, the mathematics, if you, if you understand the right curve, you can project these forward fairly reasonably and understand the, the rate of progress. But the further out you try to project, obviously, the less reliable that will be. But it's not because of a limit of limitation of mathematics, it's because of the introduction of complexity. So the further out you look, the more second order effects, third order effects are entering into the equation. There's different entrants, there's different technologies which start to blur how a, a given single category will project forward. So and additionally, you cannot project forward that which has not yet been developed. So take the year 2006, for instance. In 2006, there was absolutely no evidence that the price performance improvement of renewable energy was exponential. So if you tried to forecast out the exponential decline of the rate of renewable energy, you would have been laughed at. And all of the experts in 2006 looked at the price decline of renewable energies very linearly, and they said this will never reach grid parity with the rest of the energy sector. In fact, we reached grid parity last year uh, with solar and wind power. So lots of exciting things going on. You could not have seen that in 2006. In 2006, your smartphone did not exist. The iPhone did not exist. The Android operating system did not exist. This was just 12 and a half short years ago. You could not have forecasted what the, the, the level of disruption that this would have caused. Um, IBM Watson did not exist. It was a seed of an idea, I believe. It had crossed through the boardroom in 2006, but it had not yet beat any Jeopardy champions. Um, so there, there's, there was nothing to kind of point at and say this is going to change our world. And then we absolutely could not imagine the, the implication of applications uh, or uh, things that sit on top of all these technologies which make our lives easier. The social media, Facebook, Twitter. Facebook existed, but it was very contained. It was in that emergent stage. Uh, Twitter did not exist. We did not have Uber or Airbnb. Obviously none of this stuff you could not even dream it up in 2006, just 12 short years ago. And with the pace of change exponential, you try to forecast 12 years from now, you're gonna completely swing and miss. You try to forecast six or seven years from now, you are going to completely swing and miss. So, not to scare you, you can prepare for this. Organizationally, you can begin to get ready, and I've listed four dimensions, there's many others, um, but we'll go through four dimensions of organizational readiness. So how do you actually prepare if you're in academia or if you're in uh, business? What do you do? Well, the first most important step is try to understand your status quo. Uh, Deming famously said, every system is perfectly designed to achieve the results that it gets. 
your organization is achieving a set of results because you have a set of rules and, and structures and procedures in place that gets that set of rules. If you want to change your results, if you want to deal with disruption, you have to change your system. So the question you have to ask is what is keeping your organization in its status quo? And obviously the next question then is what do you do about it? Uh, you know, what, what levers do you try to change with respect to your status quo? Organizations have systems. These systems are what keeps the status quo in place. Uh, two that I like to point to are innovation governance systems as well as innovation ecosystems. To define those, the innovation government system is the set of structures that help your organization make decisions around innovation. So budgets, uh, how, you, how you apply resources to projects, and how do you actually make decisions? How decisive are you and what meetings, how, what do the meetings look like and how do you track progress? That's your governance system. The innovation ecosystem is that system in which growth happens. It's the physical system, the processes that you use, the people, the talent that you have on board, and the network that you employ to get things done from an innovative perspective. I took three sub-dimensions here and kind of pointed them out because they're very important. If you want something different to happen in your organizations, you have to align the reward system with those desired behaviors. Um, many innovation attempts have failed because of misaligned award systems or reward systems. Most people in modern organizations are rewarded for keeping the status quo in place. As much as they talk about wanting to be more innovative, at the end of the day, their paycheck depends on them meeting their numbers and running the same race faster. So watch out for that. Align those rewards. Um, utilize innovation-ready technical systems, particularly for companies which have a legacy, uh, whether it's an insurance company, which is where I was uh, kind of taught these lessons uh, in the, you know, beat up in the, in the playground. Um, you have these legacy systems in government, you have them. Academia, certainly you have them, which, which weigh your company down. And your innovators are going to want to act on those, those legacy systems because it's what they know. But if innovation is to occur on those systems, everything grinds to a halt. You have to work with your organizations to create a technical plan for innovations, for innovation, and make sure that you have innovation systems or, or systems which can rapidly deploy uh, new experiments. Um, and finally, you want, you want to develop appropriate innovation accounting methodology. Um, I, was, I had a sidebar, a fascinating sidebar with someone yesterday talking about innovation accounting. And you know, the fact is mo most of your systems, most of your governance systems are going to want the innovators to produce projections of return on investment. And they're going to want to say, how much cash is this going to produce in two or five or six years? And if you're talking about a Horizon 3 innovation, as an innovator, you have no idea, and you can't possibly fathom a guess about how important that is to the organization. So you have to develop a, a, a new set of innovation accounting standards for different types of innovation that your organization will take up. Um, people. It's a hard lesson I learned when I got the title of Chief Innovation Officer at Transamerica was I thought my job was going to be putting on a lab coat, throwing beanbag chairs in conference rooms, playing with Rubik's Cubes and eating Skittles all day while people came up with great ideas. And it turned into a job that was about people and politics. And as a guy with two math degrees and not a shred of empathy for anything, um, that was a very, very difficult transition for me, a very, different, a very difficult awakening uh, that I had to learn <laughs> how to deal with people and, and culture. So some of my hard-learned lessons here are, first and foremost, disruption is change. And the threat of disruption and the threat of a business even responding to disruption is a threat of change. And the people who are going to be impacted that deserve a voice. They deserve to know about how this change is going to impact them. So prepare the organization. Get it ready. Start talking about the disruption that's coming. Start talking about the potential implications of that. And then if if you have decisions that need to be made that involve employees in, in the ones that matter to them, right? This can't be a one-way dialogue of someone standing at a podium and talking to people about disruption. It has to be a two-way dialogue of what does this company do about disruption, or even community-based dialogue where the employees themselves are the ones banding around these problems and trying to solve them. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is build an empowering environment. Uh, but this is a funny term. There is no magic wand for empowerment. As a leader, I could never say, you are empowered to go play with disruption and look at things differently. Empowerment's a feeling that each 
employee needs to have, and it's created by the environment that they're in and the things that they see and the empirical evidence that they witness every day. To the extent that you can allow your employees the opportunity to learn continuously instead of to know technically, uh, you're going to be starting to build this, this empowering environment. You want to inspire creativity, but more importantly, create the space simply for creativity to happen. Allow your employees to explore with their networks what are some potential solutions to the problems they face. That will be empowering to them. If you tell them what to work on and how to do it, it will not be empowering. Collaboration. Again, creating space for collaboration is important. You want employees to take the time to network and learn who they can be working with. And ultimately, you want them to experiment and you want them to take some risks. Risk taking will go up when the risk involved with taking risks goes down. So the, the, the better you make the, this environment, the, the, less, the more risk you take out of the employee environment, the more risk they will take. A uh, little bit of an interesting lesson there. And finally, values and, and culture. Um, Peter Drucker, Drucker, the management writer, famously said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So in a minute, I'm going to show you a framework for setting an innovation strategy, but it's more important instead to, to focus on your culture and understanding what are your organization's real values. And these aren't the values that are on your mouse pad or hanging from your banner or, or on the wall next to your elevator. Those are your stated values. Your v real values are the values that people are rewarded for. So if you see someone promoted or if you see someone fired, you can start to back in what your organization's real values are. So it's not necessarily what they, stay, what they say it is, um, but it's what, what actually is in practice. But for an innovator, what you want to work from is a set of aspirational values. So how responsive are you? How nimble are you? How agile are you? How, how decisive are you as an organization? If you work from those values, and if you understand what today's values are, and you try to work towards those new values, you can develop a crosswalk from your current value set to your new value set. All right. So how do you actually respond to disruption? Well, first and foremost, and I like someone called these yesterday opportunities. <laughs> I call them change factors, but I think the next level is what opportunity do they present? Um, you need to be constantly looking at what is going to disrupt your business. Things like the competitive landscape, be monitoring that, customer preferences, consumer trends, the regulatory landscape, adjacent industries, technology advances, startups, internal pressures that you might be facing. These are all of the change factors that are presenting themselves that your organization will have to respond to. They don't always have a bat signal associated with them. Sometimes it's just a very, very weak signal that someone in the far reaches of the company is picking up on, and, but it's, in a very, it's a very important one. So once you understand what's changing, you can start to build a strategy to respond to those change factors. Essentially, all a strategy is is deciding what capabilities to put in place and deciding what insights you as a company need to learn. Once you understand what those things are, you can take your company from your current state to some future state. And strategy is that art or science of taking your company from that current state to some future state. But it is, it is as simple as installing new capabilities or generating new insights. Those will create outcomes which will move, your, which will move the needle. What complicates things <laughs> is that it's not all knowable. Right? The closer you in you are, the more you can know. So there is this kind of dotted line beyond which is the unknown. But your organization, when dealing with disruption, has to be adept not only at working within that area of clarity where you know what your key projects are, but trying to understand what's coming and how you are going to respond to that when it actually comes. So when you develop your strategy, uh, and I'll, this is my last slide and I'll leave you with this, you're going to want to execute. A lot of companies will put the cart before the horse here, though, and go immediately to the execution phase. These are your pet projects. These are your buzzworthy projects. These are the projects that don't have a strategic context. And the reason for that is that's where the heroes are made, right? It's in that execution phase that people want to work and they want to be recognized for their work. But the battle is won, not in the execution phase. The battle is won in your ability to understand your current state 
to understand the change factors that are facing you, to create a future state vision, and we talked about vision earlier today, and I love that talk, but to create a future state vision that you're working towards, um, and then develop a roadmap to get there. And that roadmap will be a set of knowns that you're doing today, but also a huge set of unknowns of stuff you're just exploring. Then and only then does it make sense to start to execute. And don't get bogged down in this execution phase. Don't spend a year here. Execute in short sprints, and then take the time to iterate. Take the time to understand how did the capability I just installed change my current state? How did the new regulation that just came, came up, how did that change my future state vision? All right, if you're asking yourselves these questions at, at, regular, caden at regular cadence or regular inter intervals, then your strategy execution cycle is going to be much more effective. For software development companies, this cycle can be as short as two weeks. Uh, for a stuffy insurance company where my background was, this was about a quarterly cycle. Right, I could deploy resources against projects for 90 days, but have them come back and say, okay, what did you learn? What did you install? And maybe for government, this might be an annual cycle. Um, that's not ideal, but it is what it is. And to just make sure you understand what are the stages and, and make sure you're not skipping any of them along the way. So you can probably tell I could talk about this stuff all day, uh, and I have. <laughs> but that's where I'm going to stop. Uh, if, if you want more, you know, connect with my book or connect with me uh, out on the Instagram or the Twitter, um, and LinkedIn is a great way to get a hold of me. So, thank you.